According to the Baker administration, the peak of COVID-19 cases in Massachusetts is supposed to be this week through April 20th. There had been some thought that Western Mass might lag behind these dates, but the chief physician executive for Bay State Health and incident commander for COVID-19 says that social distancing measures have been working. Dr. Andrew Artenstein spoke with me earlier today about the peak and many other issues surrounding this virus. In the hospital currently, we have about 170. That's across our system. So that's all four hospitals, but about 85% of them are at Bay State Medical Center. And about 30 of those are in the critical care units uh, at Bay State Medical Center. And those numbers have been pretty stable for the last week or so. So we were and remain one of the busiest COVID hospitals in the state of Massachusetts, but we have managed uh, well to keep uh, patients being discharged and going home, which is a wonderful thing, and also to keep, uh, to keep the input coming in as well. So how many total patients have you treated at Bay State within your health system? We've treated over 450 patients uh, in, since early March. It's been about five weeks now, and uh, the vast majority of those folks have either never needed to be admitted or were admitted and discharged home. So about two thirds of them fall into those two categories, which is a wonderful thing for our staff, especially to discharge patients to home. And let's talk a little bit about your staff and the personal protective equipment. How are you doing as, as far as all of the um, things that you would need to treat people? Well, it's not been easy. As I know, uh, the national story unfolds as well. Uh, we've gone to great lengths to protect the health and safety of our 12,500 caregivers and those who support the caregivers. That's the number one obligation for us as leaders, in addition to caring for the patients that we do. Uh, we've managed, and we're now in reasonable shape. We don't have a surplus, but we, we think we have enough, at least for the time being. We're working heavily right now on gowns. Believe it or not, uh, those disposable or launderable gowns are uh, very, very scarce these days. Uh, and we are continuing to source those, uh, uncovering every rock to try to find uh, uh, this material for our health givers. Can you talk a little bit about how it works if a patient is brought in um, who is suspected to have COVID-19? How are they sent to a different, perhaps, part of the hospital as opposed to the emergency room? Well, they typically come in, as you know, the emergency room is sort of the point of first contact for most ill individuals at our hospitals. They get triaged appropriately in the emergency department. Our emergency department are crackerjack at this, uh, at just about everything, because it's such a busy place to begin with. Uh, and they get appropriately managed there and isolated. Uh, appropriate personal protective equipment is worn by all staff at all times there when they're caring for patients, because there's a wide spectrum of symptoms, and we need to be sure that they're uh, taking precautions with almost anyone who presents with symptoms that are in any way consistent with this infection. Then we're able to make a diagnosis now in a much shorter time period than we were a couple of weeks ago. Testing has expanded. We have in-house testing with a turnaround time now of hours instead of days. So we can quickly disposition patients appropriately if they need to be admitted, make a diagnosis of whether they have the infection, and we put them in the appropriate isolation type of room uh, where they have appropriate airflow and appropriate supplies and equipment. And we're cohorting a lot of those patients, with, which means we have patients with this infection in, in several areas of the hospitals, but they're in separate areas from patients that don't have this infection. And how many uh, beds available do you have at the hospital? Well, we've done, I'm very proud of our team members here, and, and we have a great reason to be proud because we have created a surge capacity, meaning staff, appropriately staffed beds, both acute beds and also critical care level care beds, uh, to the tune of uh, three or four times the normal amount. So we have roughly almost 300 acute beds available. We're using some of them and we have more and about three times our normal number of critical care beds available. And we have cross-trained uh, multidisciplinary provider staff and nursing staff to care for critically ill patients. It's really been a marvelous thing to behold the teamwork. You mentioned a, a small percentage of patients are in uh, critical care. Talk a little bit about how some people might present with almost no symptoms and other people will really struggle. Well, it's a good question. I, you know, I'm an infectious disease physician by training. 
uh, and cut my teeth in the biodefense and bioterrorism area. So uh, we've seen patients uh, across the spectrum with various epidemic diseases, some of whom are completely asymptomatic and some of whom are critically ill. The same can be said of this infection. Uh, we don't know enough about the asymptomatics or the people with very few symptoms because, as you know, we have only been testing for a while and the testing does not include blood testing. The thing about blood testing, when we start doing that, which will be in a couple of weeks for antibodies, it will tell us just how many people in the community have been infected with this virus, even though they may not have had symptoms. We don't know that now. We can just guess at it. But what we do know is people can present with very mild symptoms and they can present with very severe symptoms. And some people go from one end to the other over the course of days. So they can come in with just a few symptoms and get sick quickly. So those people who would be uh, critical might need a ventilator or other treatment as well, correct? That's correct. Generally, the people in the critical care unit, the, the interesting thing about this infection is the vast majority of patients who get to the critical care unit level of care, it's because they can't get enough oxygen into their lungs and into their blood. Their lungs are just all congested with the viral uh, inflammation. Those patients typically need mechanical ventilation, about 70 or 75 percent of them, which is a high number. Uh, it's a high percentage of people uh, with this particular infection that causes uh, viral pneumonia. Uh, that's a high percentage of people needing mechanical ventilation, which is why you've heard a lot of uh, discussion over the last several weeks about the scarce supply of ventilators in the United States and why production has geared up. Because most times in critical care, we can predict the number of ventilators that will be needed. This is a little beyond those predictions. And how is base data as far as ventilators? We're in a reasonable way. We can manage the uh, capacity we've planned for. Obviously, we don't have a surplus of ventilators. No one does. But we are, uh, we are managing well and we think we can manage the predicted surge based on our own modeling. What about some of the uh, medications that have been talked about and that have been used as well, um, some with controversy, the anti-malaria drug in particular? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I mean, again, I, I, as it happens in my past life uh, in anthrax research, I studied those drugs, chloroquine specifically, because they do have an impact on anthrax, at least in the mouse model. Don't know about humans. But uh, that those drugs work at the cellular level. So there may be reason to believe, at least in a test tube and in, uh, in cultures, in laboratories, that they may work in humans. We just don't know. There are some anecdotal reports, meaning individual case reports where people may have had a beneficial effect, especially overseas in China. Uh, and there have been some reports out of the U.S., but because the studies were not done in a scientifically rigorous way, there's no way to be absolutely certain. And they do have side effects. All drugs, uh, regardless of how benign they may be or what you hear about them, can have side effects, and some of them can be more dangerous than others. So that's why we don't want people using drugs willy-nilly. You should be using them if there's the possibility that they could provide some benefit. Uh, and these may, they need to be studied, and they are being studied rigorously now, but it will be several months before we know the results of those. But that drug is hard to find. It's more available now, but it's hard to find because it's not produced by many manufacturers. So Governor Baker had mentioned that our surge in Massachusetts, we're in the midst of it, would be uh, April 10th to um, April 20th. However, Western Mass lags behind. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, actually, our, you know, we've, we've looked at our own data based on our own experience and modeled it out. There's several uh, fairly scientifically sound uh, epidemic models that you can get out there, and you've seen some of them on national and statewide uh, media. Uh, and it looks to us like we are in a stable plateau phase here in Western Mass currently. Now, that could change. There's numerous things that could cause setbacks. But for about a week, we've had a stable, although high, number of hospitalized patients. Um, and social distancing, would, or what we'd like to call physical distancing, works. Uh, that's a well-proven public health intervention, a public health tool that has worked uh, throughout history. It's just hard to practice. The fact that we've been able to do it for the last several weeks in the United States, I think, is a real testament to people taking this seriously. Uh, and the more of that we can do, the more likely it is that we can keep this stable plateau uh, as we currently have and perhaps even see a slight reduction in cases over the next several weeks. 
Uh, but there's also a few other things that could cause setbacks. And we're now deeply looking at some of these pockets of transmission in nursing homes and in vulnerable communities. You've heard a little bit about this. This is a potential burning ember that we need to extinguish because transmission can occur in those places and pretty soon it can break out into the community again. So we need to really pay attention to that and we are at Bay State Health. So just to clarify, you think that we have reached that peak in Western Mass? Well, I can tell you what we've seen. What we've seen, and we, we watch this very closely, we, we are currently at a plateau or a peak. Uh, it's lower than the initial predictions of several weeks ago because probably because of the physical distancing that's taken place, it does appear to be lower. It could be more sustained because uh, when you blunt the curve or flatten the curve, as you've heard our uh, national authorities talk about, sometimes you prolong it. But prolonging it at a lower level is a lot better than a surge that's unmanageable. So uh, one last question. I know that when uh, patients are released uh, after being treated for uh, the coronavirus, you do something special at Bay State. Can you share that with us? Sure. This was uh, the brainchild of several members of our team and from the grassroots that, uh, you know, people wanted some reason to be hopeful. People who work in the hospitals needed something to have hope and optimism. And there is reason to be optimistic. So uh, we started playing the theme song from Rocky over the overhead speakers uh, before someone was being discharged to home with coronavirus infection. And we also sent text messages and emails around for whatever staff could gather with appropriate masking and social distancing at the front lobby where people are discharged to give the, uh, a round of applause to the patients and the team members who took care of them. And that started last week and it's been, uh, it's gone viral. Uh, it's gone gangbusters. People love it because it gives them hope. Anywhere you're standing, you hear that music. Even if you can't be there, you know that there's someone leaving the hospital and getting better.